the only pressure I feel and the only pressure that our line prosecutors feel is to do the right thing. That means we follow the facts and the law wherever they may lead. The U.S. Attorney General faces mounting pressure by Democrats in Congress who say there is now sufficient evidence for the Justice Department to bring criminal charges against former President Donald Trump for his role in last year's insurgency at the U.S. Capitol. Hello, I'm Rida Fakhri. Welcome to the program. It's been over 15 months since the attack on the U.S. Capitol that almost derailed the certification process of the 2020 presidential election outcome. The House Select Committee investigating the insurrection on January 6, 2021, is now reportedly in the final stages of its eight-month-long investigation. Following a recent ruling by a U.S. federal judge alleging that Donald Trump and one of his attorneys have, quote, more likely than not committed crimes in seeking to append the election certification by Congress, some of the lawmakers serving on the January 6th committee say that it is now, quote, absolutely clear that Trump knowingly broke the law. Representative Liz Cheney, one of the committee members, says, quote, I think it is absolutely the case. It is absolutely clear that what President Trump was doing, what a number of people around him were doing, they knew it was unlawful. They did it anyway. Now, the former president faces several criminal investigations, including for his role in the violent storming of the U.S. Capitol. In recent weeks, his son-in-law and daughter have both testified before the committee investigating those events. It was also revealed that seven critical hours of phone records on that day are missing from the White House's official phone log. The U.S. Justice Department has charged nearly 800 people with crimes since the riot took place. Almost 250 of those have entered plea agreements with the government, admitting to an array of crimes from assault to impeding the official business of Congress. Last week, a leader of the Proud Boys, a far-right group which played a central role in the January 6 events, pled guilty to conspiring to obstruct official proceedings of Congress. He has said he will cooperate with prosecutors. Despite the hundreds of rioters who have now been convicted or pled guilty, no Trump administration officials have been charged. Some of the noticeable caution by the administration in its handling of the case that shook the country may well be related to the midterm elections later this year. According to a recent poll, 46 percent of Americans think Trump committed a crime on January 6, while 48 percent think he did not. Broken down by party, the contrast is stark. 87 percent of Democrats believe Trump did commit a crime. 90 percent of Republicans say he didn't. Joining me now is Barry Bennett, Republican strategist and former senior advisor to Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Barry Bennett, uh, it's been a few bad weeks for former President uh, Trump and his allies. First, a federal judge asserted that he probably committed crimes in his effort to reverse the election outcome. Then you had two former top aides being held in criminal contempt of Congress for refusing to comply with subpoenas, and a report that was published by The Washington Post, which showed that there was a, a more than seven-hour gap in his official phone logs on January 6, 2021. Certainly not good developments for him by any stretch of the imagination. If you were still advising him, what would your advice be? Well, I mean, you have to uh, put it all in context of this toxic political environment that we're currently in in Washington. Um, you know, the January 6th committee um, uh, is um, not seen as very bipartisan for most of the people on the right. Uh, and uh, it seems uh, to, to the people on the right that they're more interested in scoring political points than actually, um, you know, I think we all know what happened on January 6th. There were, you know, several hundred people who did some really dumb things and they need to be punished for it. From a Republican strategy perspective, though, wasn't it a mistake for the House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy, to pull Republicans from the January 6th committee after House Speaker Pelosi rejected two of his initial five picks. I mean, one of the two Republican anti-Trump members of the committee, Adam Kinzinger, said, quote, yeah. he made a huge mistake pulling everybody off from a strategy perspective. Isn't he right? Doesn't this leave Republicans in the dark when it comes to the inner workings of the committee? Was it, was it the worst strategic blunder that yeah, some Republicans I mean, seem to think, at least privately? 
Yeah, the Democrats wouldn't agree to ground rules that the Mr. McCarthy, Leader McCarthy, thought were fair, so he refused to participate. So they scared up a couple of Republicans. Liz Cheney is actually a good friend of mine. I, I love and respect Liz. Um, and uh, and they went ahead anyway. But was, but was that a big strategic blunder, though? How can you how can you know what is going on in the committee if you don't have your own people I think, there? I think that this process, this January 6th process, which is now we're, what, uh, 15 months from January 6th, um, and um, no one doubts what's going to be in the report. Um, the only question is, how close to the election do they insist on issuing the report? Um, which, you know, I, I think that as divided as our country is right now, over left and right, um, you're not going to persuade anybody by any report. Um, you know, the left screams democracy was threatened. Uh, the right screams democracy was threatened. Um, and, you know, here we sit. Uh, so it, it's, you know, from someone who's just not, not really a part of it, just ob observing it, it seems to be a lot of energy, time wasted on trying to score political points instead of actually getting to the root causes of why people across the country are so angry. Is it, though? Because, yes, you may not sway the opinion of the die diehards on both sides of the spectrum. Certainly no. those who are uh, loyal to pre former President Trump will remain so and have remained so. But there are no. the people in the center, aren't there? And House committee members are saying that Trump and those advising him knew no. that they were breaking the law but they did it anyway. That's what Liz Cheney, one of the panel members, has said. There could well, be I, a criminal I, I, I referral. Totally disagree with me. And totally. he's already, and he's already, as you know, facing several lawsuits by lawmakers, by Capitol Police officers. Do you believe yeah. that he will, and that he should run in the next election, even if he is indicted? You know, if if I were him, I certainly would not run, because I am incredibly rich. I'm getting to the golden years of my life. And I would go play golf and enjoy my life, and I wouldn't put up with this nonsense. So why is he? Why is he making believe that he may still run? I don't know. I, I hope it's. I hope it's not about revenge, because revenge is not a good reason to run for any office. Um, but for my, for you know, the truth is today, Donald Trump is popularity is on the RCP average is about forty four and a half, and Joe Biden's is about forty two and a half. So that makes Trump the most popular politician in America in, a, in, a, in an era where we don't like any any politicians. Uh, so, you know, do I hope he runs? No. Does he have a right to run? Of course. All right. Barry Bennett, former senior advisor to the Trump 2016 campaign. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, while some expect Trump to run again for president in 2024, he faces the specter of criminal prosecutions beyond those related to January 6th. Prosecutors in New York state are currently seeking to hold Trump in contempt of court for refusing to turn over documents in an investigation into his business practices, while federal prosecutors based in New York City have an ongoing investigation into his business as well. He also faces possible charges in Georgia related to his efforts to overturn the 2020 election results in that state and multiple lawsuits from lawmakers and Capitol Police officers by one count there are currently 19 open proceedings against the former president. Trump, however, is no stranger to legal problems. Aside from being the only U.S. president to ever be impeached twice, his career as a businessman and politician has been marred by numerous litigations. So just how likely is he to face criminal charges? Joining me now is Fred Wertheimer, president of Democracy 21, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization working to strengthen U.S. democracy. Fred Wertheimer, the, the recent finding by a U.S. federal judge that Trump's failed efforts to overturn the election results were probably criminal is making many here in Washington who would like to see the former president facing criminal charges believe that he could eventually be indicted. But is that likely to happen? Well, we don't know the answer to that yet. What we do know is what the federal judge said was extremely powerful and very unusual. Uh, we also know that the January 6th committee is going to conduct public hearings. Uh, and we expect that there will be uh, much information there, evidence uh, that may well show that the president, former president, engaged in criminal conduct. 
how the significant end. how significant though is it because you wrote recently that this could be a roadmap to hold trump accountable there's this whole notion though of intent in us criminal law some laws require that the defendant acted either knowingly or recklessly or, or corruptly to be held liable the political case against trump seems to largely have rested on his alleged irrationality that he was in denial, that he does not truly believe that he lost the election. Doesn't this undermine any potential criminal case against him? Well, you're correct that there has to be criminal intent. But if you look at the opinion of the federal judge, he laid a case, laid out a case that Trump must have known that this was illegal. He took the position that there was criminal intent. There was strong evidence of criminal intent. And we'll see what these hearings show. Uh, but, you know, the president uh, is an habitual liar. Uh, that's his standard operation. Uh, we think he did know what was going on. And he wasn't interested in what the law was. He was interested in conducting the first coup in the history of this country. That's what this was about. It was a political coup attempted and failed, uh, and we must make sure that never happens again. But could the case be made uh, by some Trump loyalists and others that when it comes to his election defeat, he did not clearly see the illegality of the case because of his denialism? Well, the case, of course, can be made. But if you go back, you will notice that for months before the election, the president was claiming that this is election was going to be stolen from him. He was setting the grounds for arguing that the election was stolen. There were more than 60 lawsuits brought uh, to prove that the election was stolen by Trump and his allies. They lost them all. Uh, you, it, you, if you want real strong evidence here, look at what happened in Georgia when he said to the secretary of state, find me one more vote than Biden got to win the election. That, that's not evidence of, of looking to find out what the, whether it was fraud or not. That is a statement that says, I want you to steal the election for me. Find me one more vote. Don't find me what the votes were. Find me the one vote I need to overcome it. But so if the, if the case is so clear cut, as you suggest, why hasn't the Department of Justice, why hasn't the Attorney General proceeded with uh, I'm with not the arguing that it is clear cut. I am arguing that there's powerful evidence here and there may well be more to come. The Attorney General will make his decision uh, later on. He's not going to make a premature decision. These cases are built from the bottom up. Uh, you will know it started with the prosecutions for January 6th, but they are now looking at uh, people who were involved in organizing January 6th. I'm not going to guarantee you that there will be an indictment or a conviction. I will tell you that there is very powerful evidence that that's precisely what happened that the president did engage in criminal conduct, that he probably did, as the judge said. Judges don't go around making that statement. And lawmakers, uh, those of them, th those are the lawmakers serving on the January 6th committee are now saying that there is clear evidence that Trump likely broke the law. Well, what's more important but is do you, the do you believe? Do you believe that the case against his post-election behavior belongs before the American le electorate, as some argue, or a jury? Uh, if he broke the law, if he engaged in criminal conduct, it belongs before a jury. That's our system. That's the rule of law. And if we start ignoring the rule of law in this country, we have lost one of our foundational principles. Now, it doesn't matter what the committee finds. It matters what evidence they document. That will be the key, and it will be a key in whether the attorney general goes forward. Well, the committee, some members have said that they have enough evidence to suggest that he likely broke the law. Do you believe, though, that the committee will move forward with a criminal referral to the Department of I Justice? I don't know. I don't think it matters. 
because they have no power to bring an indictment. The only power exists with the attorney general. What matters if they, is, is if they present powerful, overwhelming evidence that demonstrates criminal conduct occurred. It would be a symbolic move, uh, no less, though. The, the January 6th controversies seem to have also reached the Supreme Court with the recent revelations that the wife of a sitting justice, Justice Clarence Thomas, the conservative activist Ginny Thomas, exchanged at least 29 text messages with then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows during that period, encouraging him to ensure that Trump would not concede the election. Her husband was the only one of the nine justices on the Supreme Court to have voted against giving the House Committee access to the former president's records. Some, some say that Thomas should recuse himself. Others in, in Congress have gone further. Repu Representative Ocasio-Cortez says this. She says that he should resign or face impeachment, adding that it is, quote, a tipping point for the Supreme Court, warning that a failure to act puts the imperiling of democracy squarely on our shoulders. How much damage does this controversy do to the standing of the Supreme Court? Judy Thomas clearly was involved in the effort to overturn the election. Uh, Justice Thomas must recuse himself from any cases that come to the Supreme Court in this area. And if he does not recuse himself, he will do serious damage to the integrity of the Supreme Court. Uh, he should, cannot... he, should he be held responsible, though, for the actions, the statements of his wife? No, he should not be held responsible for it. But you must have a, an independent judgment here. And the appearance of conflict of interest would be overwhelming. Appearance of conflict of interest is just as important as conflict of interest. All right, Fred Worth, I'm a president of Democracy 21. A pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The role of social media has also become a significant focus for the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol as it nears the conclusion of its investigation. Earlier this year, the panel issued subpoenas for the release of information to Twitter, Reddit, and the parent companies of Facebook and YouTube after receiving, quote, inadequate responses to their requests. It is unclear whether any of the major tech companies have complied with the subpoenas to date and what data, if any, the panel was able to collect as it prepares to move into the next phase of its proceedings, which includes public hearings and the publication of a final report outlining its findings. So how did the spread of misinformation and violent extremism on social media platforms contribute to the January 6th insurrection? I'm now joined by Ramesh Srinivasan. He is professor at the University of California, Los Angeles' Department of Information Studies. Professor Srinivasan, according to the legislation that created it, the January 6th committee is tasked with investigating, quote, influencing factors that contributed to the domestic terrorist attack on the Capitol and how technology, including online platforms, may have factored into the motivation, organization, and execution. Just how central was the role of social media and how complicit were Silicon Valley companies in helping to fuel the extremism, to foment the violence that took place in and around Congress on January 6th, 2021? Well, I think what we've increasingly come to realize is that big technology companies and specifically social media platforms, right? Like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc., our emotions, and our anxieties, it, they are the raw materials in a sense that these technology platforms use, right? So what they are doing is they are able to use incredible amounts of sophisticated data analysis by these computing systems that they have to make predictions around what content to feed us, to get us outraged, to get us upset, or to get us distressed. And that's really the way in which this functions. So, we're at a point right now in the United States and much of the world where people receive their news or really their information through social media channels far more so than every media network put together. So these are media networks that influence people's psychologies and that are targeting them based on their psychology. How do you change this though? I mean, it is a reality of the societies we live in. How do you set the right balance 
between free speech and algorithms that, that can both minimize the reach and impact of hate speech and the spread of false information without trampling the rights of people to express themselves freely. That's right. Free expression and a kind of idea of public democracy and public governance have to be balanced with one another. And I think the key here is the following. I think that all of these algorithms that are being used to micro target people need to be disclosed, at least not the software code, no one's going to understand that, but how they're designed. They have to be disclosed to the public. People need to know what data is being collected about them and what influences what they see at the minimum. I also believe there should be public journalistic audits, people like yourselves who are involved in designing those systems. People who are actual journalists should be behind designing how these technologies reach people, how they order information and so on. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be some slippage. There's always going to be some crazy stuff that seeps out. But if we have the guardrails in our systems designed into these technologies, these things would be less the norm and more the exception. But do we have the guardrails and how do you put them in again without uh, without infringing on people's right to, to express themselves? And, and do you think that some of the top executives of some of the major companies that were used in the January 6th insurrection should be held liable for their role in allowing the spread of false information? I think they need to be forced to actually reckon with the reality that they are monetizing outrage and craziness, right? And I'm not sure folks are aware of this, but Facebook itself had a set of guardrails None of us know what they are, but they had a set of guardrails put in at the time of the election. But right after the election, right, which was just about eight weeks before January 6th, they, we're not even sure when, but after the election, they let these computational systems that guard co content like this, outrageous content like this, they actually let those down. And this is something that Francis Haugen, who was the Facebook whistleblower, actually disclosed publicly. They let that aw go away because they know, every big tech company knows that outrageous content is actually, it's their fodder. It really helps them out with maximizing engagement. I think the fact is that our public, like gov our government and our, and, and our politicians are, are so beholden to corporate and private interests that we just sort of trust them to do the right thing. To figure out ways to figure out to figure out ways to decide what content we're going to see. I don't really know if we can push, you know, kind of criminal charges against these tech CEOs, but now they have to be forced to actually be publicly accountable. Um, so I think I think it's the it's uh, is will it, they? well. This is a matter of what we need to do. This is a matter of actually inspiring regulators and lawmakers to say, hey, you know, these tech companies might be your biggest lobbyists. But it doesn't necessarily, which is true, both with the Democratic Party and other and other interests. But at the same time, this has gone too far. All right. Professor Ramesh Srinivasan of UCLA, thank you so much. Pleasure to have you. It's my pleasure. Nice to join you. Now, while both sides continue to fine-tune their electoral strategies ahead of the midterms next November, Democrats are carefully weighing the political risks of pressing too hard for the indictment of the former president. This could explain why the Attorney General, despite mounting pressures, has so far been conspicuously reserved, only stating that he will go where the evidence leads, when the evidence appears to already point in one direction. Similarly, despite having arguably enough evidence to request that the Justice Department initiate a criminal referral, the January 6th committee has not taken that critical decision, at least for now. This signals that after its eight-month-long investigation, which has seemingly concluded that the 45th president broke the law, the committee is split. It is also still unclear how far it might go to compel the former president and his aides to testify before Congress and whether it will issue subpoenas. Since 1953, when former President Harry Truman refused to comply with a congressional subpoena citing separation of powers and his, quote, duty under the Constitution, the Department of Justice has argued in favor of executive privilege. The seven Democratic members on the committee and the two anti-Trump Republicans will be walking a very tight rope in the coming weeks, trying to disprove any claim that their efforts to hold the former president accountable for his, his alleged role in inciting an insurrection, in instigating a failed coup, and bringing America's 234-year-old democracy to the brink are politically motivated. 
And so, in short, any appearance of political opportunism and overreach by Democrats will serve as fodder for Trump's Republican base. If he succeeds in portraying himself as the victim of, quote, the greatest witch hunt in American history, a grievance repeated ad nauseum over the last year and a half, he will reawaken and re-energize his fiery base. In the driver's seat for now, Democrats sense that they won't be in control of Congress for very long. Any wrong turn could derail their tenuous electoral strategy. That's why, for now, treading carefully may still be their best and only option. That's all from Mirida Fakhri and the team in Washington. Thanks for watching.